Good afternoon and a big welcome to all attendees to this webinar on innovating process heat supply. Power to heat and thermal storage. My name is Chris Yelland, Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence, and I'll be your host at this webinar, signed in from Johannesburg. A big welcome also to all our presenters who will be introduced to you in due course. I'm also sharing uh, a link with you now in the Teams chat facility where you can download the presenter biographies. So please take a look at the chat program, the chat text chat facility on Zoom, and you can see the link and uh, view the biographies. And a big welcome, of course, to you, the attendees, for your interest and participation. This webinar is hosted by EE Business Intelligence. I would like to acknowledge and thank Lumenium, Siemens Energy, MPACT, the Industrial Gas Users Association of South Africa, the Paper Manufacturers Association of South Africa, for their most valued support and participation in this webinar, and for the great work they do in this field. About 850 delegates have registered to attend this webinar today to hear what the presenters have to say on the subject. This attests to the relevance of the subject matter being covered, as well as to the stature of the presenters. May I express a big thanks to all the presenters for their participation and for the time and effort that they've put in. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and links to view the webinar on demand and to download the presentations will be made available shortly to all those who registered to attend, as well as publicly. Colleagues, a process heat represents a large share of industrial consumers' final energy demand and is still largely supplied by fossil fuels. However, the gas supply cliff in South Africa challenges the economics and security of supply of conventional supply models. Coupled with increasing decarbonization pressures, alternative solutions are gaining traction. In addition to traditional alternatives like biomass or electric boilers, innovative solutions such as thermal energy storage offer substantial technical and economic benefits to industrial users. They also enable access to renewable energy sources, thereby reducing scope to emissions for the industrial sector. The carbon tax at home and the increasing application of carbon border adjustment mechanisms by South Africa's major export markets now requires companies to consider low carbon intensive options on all of their key inputs. So this webinar will discuss power to heat as a sustainable, affordable alternative to conventional fossil fuel based process heat supply for industrial users. It will focus on thermal energy storage technologies, innovative heat supply business models, and will give examples for specific production sites. Colleagues, the program for the day has been widely circulated, but a link to download the program will be shared again here now on the Zoom chat facility. So I'm going to ask my producer, Ian, to put that link on the chat facility where you can uh, download and view the program for the day. We have four expert presenters today who will each give 20-minute presentations. This will then be followed by a 30-minute open discussion and Q&A session, and then thanks and closure by myself. While the presentation is in progress, please do send us your questions on the Zoom Q&A text facility, not on the chat facility. You may also put up your hands to ask questions verbally during the Q&A session itself. We have set aside about 30 minutes after the presentations for our expert presenters to answer just some of your questions. So without further ado, I am now going to call upon our first presenter, who is Yako Human the Executive Officer at the Industrial Gas Users Association of South Africa, and he's also the CEO 
of a value chain construct. Now, a month or so ago, Yako gave a presentation explaining the so-called gas cliff in South Africa, which is a massive problem facing not only industrial gas users, but also the whole country and uh, has the potential to cause massive unemployment. Uh, so I'm really pleased to have Yako again uh, today to recap on the problem uh, and to give us an indication of where things stand at the moment and uh, where things uh, could or should be going in future. But to tell you a little bit more about Yako, he is the executive officer of the Industrial Gas Users Association and he's co-chair of the BUSA, that is the Business Unity South Africa Gas Energy Subcommittee, uh, which provides leadership to industry on gas energy availability, policy, and pricing. Yako has been the CEO of Value Chain Construct since 2016, and they provide strategic consulting and advisory services to private and public clients uh, on gas energy strategy, capital project, and a broad spectrum of supply chain optimization issues. He was the head of group procurement at NAMPAC from 2012 to 2016 and the group supply chain executive at Consul Glass from 2002 to 2012. And before that, he held senior uh, supply chain and project management positions at ESCOM from 1994 to 2002. Yako has a bachelor's and master's degrees in economics from the University of Stellenbosch. So it's a great pleasure now to hand over to Yako for his presentation. Over to you, Yako. Chris, thank you very much um, for, for the kind introduction and, um, of course, the opportunity to present this particular important topic uh, to, uh, to this forum. I mean, the, the relationship between gas energy and industrial heating is obvious, but perhaps what is less obvious is the current status of, the, um, of our regional gas play. Um, and, and, and I hope that through the next couple of minutes that uh, I'll be able to convey to the audience exactly what is happening, where things stand and where we go and, and what the particular risks are. Just by way of introduction, the, um, the Industrial Gas User Association <clears throat> certainly is a, it, it, it represents the backbone of the manufacturing sector in South Africa, of course, um, probably the most intensive in, uh, in industrial heating and uh, where, where gas is mainly used for industrial heating purposes. Um, to a lesser extent, there's some private uh, or embedded uh, gas to power generation as well. But essentially, it is the chemical, industrial heating, and to a lesser extent, also ex uh, the, the, the um, gas to power generation for these organizations. It covers a wide spectrum, of course, primary manufacturing, secondary manufacturing, steel, ceramics, mining, uh, FMCG, even, even to the bread that we eat on a daily basis that are baked by some of our members. The gas sector is a significant block, economic block in, in South Africa. Um, together with Sassel, of course, I mean, um, we, uh, we represent probably about 600 billion rands of year, uh, a year in terms of turnover. These members that you see here employ about 60 to 70,000 people. Um, and uh, of course, the, 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 embed, the, the reliance on gas energy is critical for these organizations at present, will be so for the coming decade or decade and a half, perhaps two. And uh, of course, uh, we are faced with particular challenges with regards to gas energy security, which we'll, which we'll highlight um, in the coming minutes. So maybe just to take the audience through the, the, the gas landscape and overview, it is important to understand where we come from. So I think first and foremost, from 98 to 2005, this is really where gas energy was sort of mooted as the next sort of energy wave or, or next energy type within, within the South African context. It started to uh, take place in the white paper in 98. The 2001 Gas Act was promulgated. In 2001, the Mozambican and South African governments entered into a, a, a bilateral agreement. The um, the regulatory agreement was also then concluded between Sassel and, 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 and the two governments, which really led to the establishment of the vast infrastructure that we have at the moment, mainly the Romco pipeline, which is an 800-kilometer pipeline coming from Mozambique, 
and the development of associated transmission and distribution networks to all our industries that we have at the moment. So this is during this period was really where where gas energy uh, started to to take place from an infrastructure development point of view. I think the exciting part of this, the adoption of gas energy was quite rapid. I mean, the, it, it certainly matured in the in the adoption of large industries moving away from coal, um, heavy furnace oils, for example, and uh, it certainly found a place in policy. There was the, the initial onset of shale gas was reported also during this period, and the discoveries in Mozambique and Tanzania um, were also made significant discoveries that are currently playing out as well. But of course, we started with uh, load shedding, electricity blackouts in 2008, and uh, ESCOM <clears throat> also turning to costly OCGD uh, diesel, diesel power generation during this period. Now, <clears throat> important was this particular period between 2013 and 2018. The world started to develop LNG markets globally. We saw the onset of short-term contracts which really attracted buyers uh, on, on a global basis. Technology improvements to move gas in a liquid form around the world. We, we refer to it as the new crude. Um, and um, the, 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 the buying patterns and the, and, and the search for gas and investment in associated LNG infrastructure really took off during this period. Currently in Mozambique, we see the onsets of the northern part developments, and uh, there's currently investment flowing up to about $128 billion up to 2029 is flowing into this region as we speak. South Africa itself announced various programs from about 2012 for gas growth. There was the uh, onset of the gas utilization master plan. But of course, the state did not act or execute on any of these policies in any way or form. It led to a period of stagnation. And uh, we also saw that uh, many of our international gas majors or oil companies, as we refer to them, left South Africa in this, uh, in this period of stagnation. Importantly was also this, this following period between 29 and 23. There's consistent shortages of gas. I mean, demand far outstrips supply at the moment. Um, we have limited capacity. There's no receiving infrastructure in South Africa for gas energy or LNG for that matter. There's policy uncertainty. That's that's uh, par for the course for today as far as gas energy is concerned. And um, gas energy insecurity starts to set in amongst this, uh, amidst this dwindling successful supply, which we will refer to just now. Certain irregular or irrational outcomes by the regulator as far as pricing is concerned started to uh, emerge during this period, but ultimately we're not developing our up upstream gas potential. Significant, and we'll touch on some of those points just now, whereas this, the rest of our neighbors, I mean, particularly in Namibia and uh, the government of Mozambique, they're really kicking dust in our eyes as far as monetizing the exploration of gas potential is concerned offshore. So, the South African state during this period certainly remained in abeyance, despite various conversations needing more gas, the starting to discuss the gas risk that we face. And we see the increasingly aggressive role of some of our SOEs in starting or trying to take position in, in the gas value chain across the markets, but at the same time also keeping it closed for, for, for development. So a lot of market uncertainty. Uh, started to creep in during this period. So <clears throat> also where we're finding ourselves right now, of course, as Sassel confirms that there's a gas cliff in, in, in 30 months' time, actually 24 as we speak. So there are no discernible alternative projects. Significant investments continue in Mozambique and now in Namibia as well. And the SA state role remains completely unclear in terms of how to solve these particular issues and risks that we have. Industrial investments have halted uh, since Sassel's announcement that the gas would stop flowing in 2026. And that, of course, does not bode well for the medium term outlook for the South African economy. So overall, the energy landscape and network economy deterioration really bearing on our competitiveness. It's not only gas. It is the ability to deliver electricity, water, our logistics, our ports, etc. is really starting to take a toll um, in the manufacturing landscape as we speak. 
So our view is that the South African state policy remains unclear and whatever policy position it has miss missing critical timelines. We need to make bold decisions. That is clear. And um, we'll touch on some of those in the in the coming slides. The onset of our gas crisis actually sits with Sassel. Sassel is the only supplier of bulk industrial uh, uh, natural gas and methane-rich gas coming through our pipelines. And you will notice on this particular slide that there is a decline imminent in this dark line that flows down here from roughly about 27, 28. But what really has happened and spurred Sassel into action recently was that the this light blue block, which is really the exploration which would have carried us as a country for a few more years, this exploration did not result in any material gas find for Sassel and, of course, the South African economy. That basically implied that Sassel had to go back to the drawing board. And Sassel is now focused on extending this dark blue bit. As you can see, there's a fine line coming down here, which really the, the balance of that to the right is really dependent on technical interventions in the existing fields. And Sassel at the moment is currently considering that and looking how we could extend the bridge. For now, Sassel's official position, of course, is that gas will stop flowing in 20, June 2026. Post this period and also post um, the, or, or in the absence of any material natural gas finds, Sassel is unlikely to use LNG in, it, in its liquid fuels production at, uh, at Secunda, with some LNG potential, of course, um, at, its, uh, at its processes in Sasselberg. Now, of course, this picture being a single, de singly dependent entity supplying gas into the South African market, of course, does not hold much promise as far as the economic landscape for South Africa is concerned. Now, <clears throat> if you look at this particular map, we'll just touch on this. Um, so gas at the moment uh, in 2024 is flowing from Pande to Mani. It's this field that is in decline as we speak. And there's currently no particular alternative. And in the absence of any further gas exploration success in Pande to Mani, it is unlikely that we will see um, the extension of gas flowing from these fields, particularly under the PPA license that Sassel holds. Gas flows down about 175 petajoules. There's about 15 petajoule consumption in Maputo and about 160 petajoules flowing to Secunda. At Secunda, which is the single biggest consumer of this natural gas, the balance is then uh, moved into the Gauteng network by Sassel. And then there's methane-rich gas, the byproduct of Sassel's uh, processes at Secunda, which then flows down and serves the large industries and mining operations in KwaZulu-Natal and also those demand nodes in Mpumalanga, Middleburg, Whitbank area. The problem is, of course, that we, in the in, in the decline of this Pane Tamane, our only other alternative that we have and which we need to find very quickly and establish very quickly, um, the solution as industry sees it is focused around these shaded areas that you see on the slide. Now, <clears throat> what this means is that by 2027, perhaps in the middle of 2026, we need to have LNG importation infrastructure at Maputo with a pipeline connection into the Rompco. And from there, we need to then move that gas along the Rompco into the existing network but critically important is a linkage at Secunda between the Romco and the Lilly pipelines, those three shaded dots that you see here. That will give KwaZulu-Natal the necessary energy security that it requires within these timeframes. Emphasizing this, of course, are the proposed developments of LNG infrastructure at Richards Bay. We take notes of the VOPAC and Transnet award of the development of an onshore LNG uh, facility, regasification and storage facility. But of course, that is dependent on power developments in Richards Bay, which will come. Our view simply is that this will not necessarily happen in the timelines that we see. So what we envisage is that gas will have to flow from Aputu Matola into the Romco and down the Lily and into the Gauteng network. We certainly note the developments of Renogen in the Northern Free State for distributed LNG, certainly a niche market, 
and particularly for smaller users that are essentially off the pipeline network grid. Similarly, we see the kinetic co-developments. These are prospective gas fields currently under development, which will probably follow a very similar pathway uh, from a development perspective as Renogen in terms of small incremental inputs and and um, and and permeation into the South African market. What is critically important here is you'll see the shaded areas also requiring gas to power off the Romco. We need this facility and we need some gas to power on the Mozambican side of the border in order to bulk up demand. These infrastructure developments take a lot of capital, a lot of risk, and the more volume we can build as a country to push through these systems, of course, the more efficient they become. Going forward beyond 27, and not to dwell on that, of course, is then an outlook which, in our view, would entail infrastructure and LNG development in Richards Bay, power station conversions, new gas-to-power facilities in, in line with the IRP 2023. We see the onset of gas-to-power on the Mozambican side of the border, on the Romco power station conversions from Eskom and even in Johannesburg. And then coming to the southern complex, of course, significant potential in Kocha, uh, significant potential in 11B, 12B uh, coming on shore. And then, of course, the significant developments that we see on the Muslim and the Namibian side, um, potentially uh, supplying gas into the Western Cape um, and 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 uh, the associated demand for gas there. So two particular markets that we see, not necessarily interlinked, but a north and south. But the north certainly has a very particular issue and problem that it needs to address very, very urgently. The northern parts of Mozambique um, will certainly develop uh, in our view, but it's got little bearing because we don't see the potential for this pipeline connection coming into map, perhaps into the future. Uh, regional gas finds with relative close, close proximity to the Panditamani fields and the net associated network could well carry us, but these are certainly maybe a decade and a decade or two away. What the gas master plan is addressing in our view is a view is a long-term view and certainly not the short-term issues, but we'll make some comments on the gas master plan as we see it. So what are the risks and what are the proposed solutions? Right now, if you the prop the biggest problem and risk that we face as a country is time. Considering the the investment of this economic block, the primary manufacturing sector and the exposure to gas energy, it is critical that we get these timelines right as a country. The first option or focus area, of course, if you look at these are where we are now on the left hand side, more or less in May, May 2024. And the current official position by Sassel saying that we cannot supply industry beyond July, beyond June 2026. So the option that we refer to in terms of total energy, as you can see here, if we are able to reach, or if these developers and investors, total energy and his local partners are able to um, reach FID at this point in time, there is a period for financial close with a two year uh, commissioning and construction period. That brings us in theory and on paper to the middle of 2027. That is the earliest that we believe that we could bring gas into the existing network into South Africa to address the, the cliff. Romco is a very important partner. Romco needs two pieces of capital work that needs to take place. They need to connect the BGC Total Energy project into the Romco, but also to facilitate that linkage that we refer to between the Romco and the Lilly pipeline to secure gas energy for KZN. Now, if you look at that, it is all dependent, of course, on the BGC Total Energy FID. Um, from there, it will flow in terms of the financial close and the construction and commissioning. But should Transnet allow, and Transnet is not necessarily favorable of this interconnection, should Transnet allow that the uh, the connection with the Lilly pipeline link could easily follow within the prescribed timelines. Sassel has a very similar point of view 
in terms of the uh, total energies and the earliest that Sassel or anyone else for that matter could bring uh, LNG into the country is also around about June 2027. Now, Richards Bay is interesting. Um, Richards Bay, the VOPAC developments, etc. The developers there are, of course, in a base case assessment period at the moment. We hope that this uh, that there will be a business case for this project, but we see that dependent on gas to power, and we see refer there to the I4P process currently underway. We see the financial close for these projects to take place first and foremost, where FID could be reached probably around about January 26. From there, a four-year construction commissioning period has to follow. Also, the EIA processes and all other regulatory uh, elements need to follow. This project, in our view, carries some project on project risk. The marine infrastructure is a TNPA project. Of course, this project in itself, but also then the dependency on gas to power is critical to bring this project to bear, in our view, around about the end of this decade. From a solution perspective, just very briefly, I think as a country, we you can clearly note that we are in a dead zone. We don't, on paper, have gas supply from June 2026 until probably the end of 2027, an 18-month period. It is in this instance where we need to work very closely with all technical solutions that may be, um, uh, be provided in order to carry us across this bridge until the alternative gas is available. Absolutely critical because the alternative is just incomprehensible from an economic and employment perspective in South Africa. The second solution, and this is something that industry has now decided and will be developing, is a, a, a system of gas aggregation. Currently, the market is completely defragmented. Um, and this is simply a move in the absence of future um, LNG consolidators to move and to consolidate the demand and make infrastructure bankable um, and, and, and feasible for development. Typically, these are roles that the state fulfill um, in taking some of their infrastructure risk or the risk on these type of infrastructure. But in the absence of the state, the private sector simply has no other alternative but to fulfill this role as aggregator. The risk assumption and the spread thereof and we're asking currently the role of the state um, to take some of that residual risk in future gas energy infrastructure developments. The third solution is we simply have to build demand, and the demand build requires the consolidation of industrial demand, and of course the gas to power, which is currently contained in the I4P, but also the potential for ESCOM to procure demand of Mozambique and gas to power developments on that side of the border. Lastly, the Romco Lily Link, we've touched on that. The government is referring to government to government gas volumes. You might have picked up in the media recently statements around 200 petajoules of state owned gas to be offered to the market, but the private sector still has to see the details around this. It's unclear and uncertain how this will follow. And then, of course, more importantly, but perhaps more long term solution. South Africa has significant offshore gas and the exploitation and the monetization from an economic development perspective is critical to also act as the um, catalyst for infrastructure development in South Africa. On the solution side, very important is the gas, the role of the gas aggregator. Industry is currently looking at the establishment of a gas aggregator by industry for industry. What this means is that in order to develop infrastructure, demand needs to be consolidated, risk needs to be shared, but you typically would have off-takers in future, gas users, to the right-hand side of this particular slide, and these companies will have a direct share and will control the gas aggregator uh, company that is to be established going forward. Offtake agreements will be concluded between the offtakers and the industry-owned um, gas aggregator company. And then the gas aggregator company will upstream then conclude supply agreements, whether it's pipeline transportation, infrastructure agreements, LNG or pipe gas solutions um, that comes about. This is absolutely an, a critical move and industry has now looking, has been looking for the last six months 
into the feasibility of this. The program seems to be feasible and industry is actually moving to implement this. A very important move to defragment and move the market forward in the absence of the state. Just one or two last comments on the gas master plan for those that have an interest in this and have studied this. The gas master plan is a document that was issued by the government early this month. If you look at the hotspots, uh, those that are colored in red at the moment, um, and I just want to make one or two comments before closeout. But very importantly, um, if you look at these hotspots, on the left hand side, you're sitting with demand nodes, and at the top, you're sitting with supply nodes. And where these matrices meet or these matrix points meet is where the government believe the solution for gas energy is. If you take, for example, Durban, so Durban is then, uh, we assume it is uh, KwaZulu-Natal. And if you cast your eye on that line down, you will see that the government actually puts the KwaZulu-Natal solution the, the emergency or urgent solution on the back of the RMI4P car power ship transaction. And then later on, um, firm infrastructure around FSRU or on land infrastructure, presumably as per the VOPAC Transnet development. Now, if you go to Gateng, of course, currently it's being supplied by Pandit Tamani, very tiny bits uh, in terms of Virginia. But the government then refers to as a regional source for gas uh, coming on stream by 2027. And then furthermore, Gateng being supplied by Richards Bay FSRU and, of course, going forward in 2030 as well. Middleburg, uh, we see that the uh, gas master plan referred to significant power generation in Middleburg, which we don't fully understand yet, but very similar Pandit Tamani is not going to be supplying gas to this facility, of course. It's, there is simply no more gas. Uh, the regional source, we don't know what that means. Also, coming back down to Sasselberg, very similar in terms of its view. Now, the problem with these things is that if you look at Mossel Bay, for example, there's no way that Block 11B and 12B is going to be supplying gas uh, by 2027 to Mossel Bay. Nor is... Um, 2A going to supply gas to Mossel Bay by 2027. 2A is the block on the west coast, which is then presumably mooted to supply Atlantis, Ankerlich, and all industries in the Western Cape, together with Mossel Bay from those fields. Now, the intent of a gas master plan, first and foremost, should be to, number one, assess and put a base case together, which is very realistic. But the key job of a gas master plan is to present a very probable outcome based on risk and based on economics. We think that the gas, ma gas master plan in its current draft certainly doesn't deal with this. And if you score these solutions as you see it here accordingly, we see that longer term in terms of FSRU infrastructures to the right of this uh, table, you see that the solutions at play around uh, uh, Ngakura, Richards Bay and Saldana Bay, FSRU solutions are coming about. But for the rest, there is still a significant amount of uncertainty in terms of where this gas is going to come from, particularly considering the gas cliff that we face. So we are engaging with the DMRE on this topic, of course, and um, we hope that the regional source, which is very much reliant, um, on supplying gas to Gauteng and hopefully also KZN, but we also don't fully understand the role of the car power ships in solving the immediate gas crisis as it stands, particularly when one consider that the these options have lapsed and also considering that at least when they were still um, relevant, that the first five years or so, um, the gas supply were only destined for power generation and not necessarily on land supply. So still a lot of uncertainty with regards to the gas master plan, but we certainly don't see that it is designed to um, deal with a short term issue. Chris, with that, um, I close out and um, I'll, happy, I'll be happy to take any questions and answers when appropriate. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yako, uh, for that. And I think he's painted a very stark picture that for all the talk, 
uh, there is still a huge uncertainty. Now, look, Yako comes from the gas supply industry, uh, from the gas user industry, at least. And, and, and so the, he's specifically looking at uh, gas as a heating solution. Uh, and of course, that is what uh, is being used at the moment uh, for industrial uh, process heat, uh, largely. Uh, but of course, there are other sources of, uh, of process heat. And this webinar is also going to explore uh, these as well. Uh, so it's a great pleasure now uh, to introduce you uh, to uh, Maria Vascolathis. I hope I've got that right, Maria. My pronunciation of Portuguese is uh, very limited. Uh, uh, she is the co-CEO of a company in Germany, uh, Luminian, uh, and uh, they are a, a technology company primarily, and uh, they have some interesting solutions, uh, which uh, I'm sure she will tell us more about. Uh, so um, Maria joined Luminian as the co-CEO at the end of 2023. Luminian is a provider of thermal energy storage which represents a technically robust and competitive elect electrification solution for process heat supply of, for the manufacturing industry. Maria holds a PhD in electrical engineering and has worked on topics related to energy systems for RWTH Aachen University, for Fraunhofer, a research uh, uh, operation in Germany, and startups uh, since 2015. She's worked on topics uh, uh, ranging from digitalization of electricity networks to the reform of the electricity markets and the implementation of energy communities. With her ex expertise in energy systems, she is driving forward Luminian's work in supporting industry to navigate through the options and implications of different decarbonization pathways. So it's really a great privilege to have you here with us, uh, Maria, uh, signing in from Berlin in Germany, uh, and, and talking not only about process heat uh, from alternative sources, uh, renewable energy sources uh, for one, uh, but the whole uh, issue of decarbonization, which is another issue facing South African industry. So with that, I have pleasure in calling on Maria to make her presentation. Thank you. Over to you, Maria. Thank you so much, Chris. I'm very excited to be here and to have the chance to talk to you about process heat supply um, decarbonization with the help of thermal storage. Um, I would like to start with a very brief overview of maybe the magnitude and, and nature of the challenges faced by industry in this context before diving into the specifics of the aluminium solution and then presenting very briefly a case study that we did um, for a mock application in, in the South African context. Um, so heat, of course, plays a, a major role in our decarbonization path, representing half of uh, global final energy consumption and 38% um, of CO2, uh, energy-related CO2 emissions. Um, at the same time, we are lagging behind in our decarbonization efforts in this sector, with uh, only slightly over 10% um, of global heat consumption coming from renewable energy. Uh, and current estimates suggest that we actually need to pick up the pace. We would need a 2.2 faster advancement of renewable consumption, uh, heat consumption, if we want to reach our net zero uh, emission targets by 2050. And process heat plays a very big role in this. And of course, it's a bit challenging, challenging because um, the, it varies significantly across sectors, um, which translates, of course, in very different requirements and different strategies for decarbonizing process heat supplies. Just to pick out two examples, in the pulp and paper in the food and beverage sectors, we have a situation in which process heat represents over 50%, sometimes even up to 70% of final energy consumption of specific production sites. And this is process heat in the range of more or less up to 450 degrees which uh, makes it very suitable, for example, uh, for decarbonization with thermal storage. Now, besides the generally agreed um, need to decarbonize, um, industry faces two other major pain points uh, in this context that actually increase the pressure to look at options and look at alternatives to switch energy supply sources. One is around the topic of volatility, uh, not only volatility of renewable energy sources, but also volatility 
of um, energy markets. And the second pain point is um, overall the question of price levels. So we've seen in the last three to four years how quickly the situation can change, how drastically the prices can increase, putting industry into a very tough spot to keep the manufacturing process going. So addressing these issues, of course, uh, is a very urgent matter. However, it's very complex um, and a major challenge because it's tied to very significant financial financial commitments and possibly also very drastic process modifications. And this is all outside of industry's core business. So it's not an easy task. And um, looking at the technological options that industry has to address these issues, we see that temperature range is one of the key drivers for technical viability. So the higher we go in the temperature range, the less options we have to switch supply sources. Um, it's generally agreed that electrification is a very promising way to, um, to do this, uh, not only because it covers a very wide range of um, temperatures, but also because um, it gives direct access to renewable electricity and also because it's a highly efficient um, process in most cases. Um, and within the pool of technically viable solutions uh, to decarbonize, um, one key influencing factor uh, for commercial viability of the solutions um, actually is technical efficiency. Um, if we look at the temperature ranges in the medium range, so um, medium to high temperature ranges, uh, the options that we have are uh, limited, of course. And if we look at the technical efficiency here, we normally have a status quo where we have a fossil fuel based supply. So we have efficiencies ranging somewhere between 75 to 85 percent. Um, and um, the options that we generally look at are in some cases biomass, which is, however, a little bit specific because it generally requires having the feedstock on site. Um, then we've spent quite a few um, years looking at hydrogen. However, for this application of process heat, we see a few challenges, one of them being the lack of short-term availability, both of um, input and, and infrastructure, but also um, conversion losses are a big issue in this context. So from our perspective, in this temperature range, we see that the two most promising options are thermal storage and electric boilers. Um, boilers are very interesting because they have relatively low investment costs. They are very well established technology, well known and have very high efficiency. However, they don't really help addressing the two pain points that we talked about before, uh, because uh, the problem with e-boilers is that the electricity intake has to occur simultaneously to the thermal energy demand. So we don't really have the chance to switch the time at which we have electricity intakes, except maybe for demand side management measures. And this is why we think that thermal storage will play a very crucial role in decarbonization of process heat, because the flexibility of storing heat for a while allows us to decouple the charging process from the discharging process, meaning that we can actually shift the electricity intake to times in which uh, the prices are low or where there is a high availability of renewable energy sources. Now, there are, of course, many different ways to design uh, a, store, a thermal storage and very different materials that can be used. In the case of Lumenion, uh, we chose a system that consists uh, only of a state-of-the-art component and is very easily scalable. So just to give you a short overview of our technology, starting with the charging process, uh, we basically run electricity through our heating elements, heating them up, which, of course, heats up the air around them, which in turn heats up the steel core. And this is how we store the heat for a while. And whenever there is a thermal energy demand, the fans, the industrial fans, circulate the air out of the storage core into the air duct system and then through a heat exchanger. If, for example, the production side needs steam, we would place a steam generator there, which would then supply um, steam at the temperature and pressure requirements for the site. We then, of course, have all the necessary electrical control equipment to charge and discharge the storage. And finally, we have state-of-the-art side and bottom insulation. And this is basically it. So it's uh, really an, an off-the-shelf solution, uh, which can be manufactured globally using almost exclusively um, local content. 
And this is uh, what we consider one of our main USPs. So having a very technically robust um, solution made out of state-of-the-art components that can very easily um, be built in different geographies worldwide. Um, this is also one of the reasons why we, we chose steel um, as a core material. But besides that, of course, steel has very good thermal um, characteristics. And another key reason for choosing it is steel has virtually no end of lifetime. So this gives our storage, of course, a very, very long asset lifetime. And even after decommissioning, we have a high residual value uh, due to the fact that we can then sell the steel in secondary markets. Um, from a commercial perspective, um, there are basically two options to go for thermal storage. So the status quo that we encounter normally is an in industrial site that has uh, two different providers, one for electricity, one for uh, the fossil fuel source, normally natural gas, to cover the heat demands. Um, and if um, the industry decides to go for thermal storage, there is the option of, of course, doing the direct investment. So the industry would buy the thermal storage, ideally couple it with some on-site renewable sources, which of course would imply having a very high upfront investment, but at the same time, it would um, significantly increase the autonomy of um, that industry, which would give them control over a very large share of their own energy supply. As an alternative, uh, in order to avoid uh, the high capex upfront, um, there is also the option to invite a third party to take on that investment. So a third party would purchase the thermal storage and the renewable assets, and then negotiate a bilateral agreement with the industrial customer um, to supply the energy. This is a very well known concept in the electricity sector through power purchase agreements. And basically the idea here would be to enhance this agreement to also include process heat. So the clear benefit is not to have the high upfront investment and to have a long-term price security at a low competitive prices. Uh, maybe the only downside compared to direct investments is that it would, of course, limit the leeway of industrial customers to participate in profit sharing with the investor of the assets. Um, so these product, products, thermal storage, the, the markets are, of course, um, fairly new, but uh, they have gained a lot of traction in the last years. So there is already a very large number of systems in place. And in the case of Lumenian, we have built three storages so far. We started with our prototype 500 kilowatt hour storage here in Berlin. Our first commercial project with Buttonfall was a 2.4 megawatt hour system that supplies heat to the district heating network here in Berlin. And we're very excited about our third storage, that, uh, which is a 20 megawatt hour system for a company called Besto, who's the largest organic frozen vegetable producer in Germany. And this system will be the almost exclusive provider of saturated steam for their production process, delivering steam at uh, up to 17 bars. Um, we're very excited about it. We're currently finalizing construction and commissioning, and we're looking forward to starting operation in the fall um, of this year. And we're more than happy to organize site visits if you want to see such a system in operation. Now, after having given a short overview of the general uh, features of thermal storage and maybe the specific uh, features of, of Lumenian, the question normally is, when is this a competitive solution? When is this, for my production uh, side, for my specific case, um, the way to go? And um, the answer, of course, is it depends because every production side um, has, of course, its own specificities. But generally, we see that there are three determining factors uh, for competitiveness. And first and foremost, it is energy demands. So after having um, clarified the technical feasibility, so is the, for example, the process heat demand compatible with our temperature ranges? Uh, we see that the higher the frequency and duration of uh, the thermal energy demand is generally the normal, the business case. The second important question is, how do we define competitiveness? Are we comparing this solution to the status quo, which would generally make the comparison necessary between our storage and a natural gas fired boiler? Or are we comparing this setup with an alternative decarbonization setup, which of course is a very uh, different question. And the third influencing factor is the availability or potential to implement renewable energy sources 
for self-consumption. The reason for this is not only because it would, of course, guarantee uh, the origin of the electricity that, uh, for charging the storage, but also because we generally see that it um, highly benefits the economics of these solutions. Um, because, of course, the unit costs would be generally lower than the grid supply costs, but also because in many different regulatory frameworks, there are very proactive incentives uh, for self-consumption. Now, to make this um, overall uh, case for thermal storage, uh, storage a little bit more tangible, we've um, calculated a, a very uh, short case study in which we basically um, have created a mock production site and placed it in South Africa. So we've um, assumed that there is a production site that has a flat steam demand of five ton per hour of saturated steam, so at nine bar more or less. And we have an uh, electricity demand of 15 gigawatt hours per year with slight monthly variations. Uh, South Africa is of has, of course, very favorable conditions for renewable generation with uh, full load hours of solar PV uh, of up to 1,500 and full load hours of wind of up to 1,800. Uh, 1, we assume that for the top-up electricity, so for the share of electricity that would not come from on-site renewables, uh, we would have uh, the ESCOM tariffs, um, which have a very strong variation between the winter and the summer months. Now with this setup, uh, what we normally see is that most production, for most production sites, the decarbonization pathway uh, always goes in stages. Of course, this is not something that will go from zero to 100 uh, in, just, in just one project. And normally the first step that industry takes is to invest in on-site renewables as far as possible to start uh, decarbonizing the electrical demand. So for this specific case, if we assume that the production side would start uh, the decarbonization process with a five megawatt peak solar plant, uh, which would basically yield a 30% um, decarbonization of the electricity demand, which is pretty average. Um, but this only translates into a renewable coverage ratio of total final energy demand of around 10%. This means that the five megawatt peak plants would only um, cover 10% of total final energy demand of the production site. If we go a step further and say we also want to decarbonize the steam demand, not only the electrical demand, we would then suggest a setup in which uh, we increase the solar capacity to 23 megawatt peak and couple this with a 42 megawatt hour storage. And in this case, as we can see here, we have a renewable coverage ratio of 57%. This means that over 50% of the annual electrical and steam demand of this production site would be covered by the 23 megawatt peak solar plant. As an alternative, if um, the production site has the possibility of also installing wind, which we normally highly recommend, uh, even though we are aware of the economic and administrative challenges of wind projects, we would suggest a setup in which we have 19 megawatt peak of solar coupled with six megawatt of wind and a slightly smaller system of 38 megawatt hour thermal storage. In this case, we would reach uh, 66 uh, percent renewable coverage ratio of total final energy demand. Now for the interesting part, looking at the economics of these different pathways, uh, we generally look at three key indicators uh, for the economic assessment. First is, what does it mean for my steam costs? Second is, what does it mean in terms of investments? And the third is, bottom line, what does it mean for my annual energy-related bills? So when I compare it to my current status, for example, I production sites have an electricity and a gas bill. And uh, if we compare this um, to, to the new setup in which we we'll basically have to break down the investments into a yearly basis, how does it perform compared to that? And for the example that we brought, we started with the case in which we assume the production site would electrify the process heat demand with an electric boiler, which is the first column right here. We would have an electric boiler um, in the ranges of four megawatts which would have relatively low capex, but as we can see here, the steam cost would be pretty high. So we're talking about almost 700 uh, rand per ton in this case. And this is uh, not because of the investment cost of the boiler. This is just because of the issue we talked about before, which is that a boiler doesn't really give the chance to shift the electricity intake. So basically the input electricity that would be needed to generate the process heat would be very, very high. 
comparing this with a first case for the thermal storage, which is the case in which we say, let's implement the minimum size thermal storage needed to guarantee that we can cover 100% of the thermal demand would mean to build a 26 megawatt hour thermal storage, which would have, of course, higher capex compared to the boiler. But as we can see, it would lower the steam costs. So we're talking about 611 rand per ton compared to the almost 700 from before. And the reason for this is because shifting the points in time in which we would take the electricity from the grids to lower prices would significantly reduce um, the price that we would pay for the input electricity, which would then, of course, also positively reflect in the annual energy-related bills. In the third case, what we did was to say, okay, let's not look at the minimum size storage. Let, let's assume that we can optimize the storage size in order to um, actually maximize the benefits from price arbitrage. And in this case, we would suggest having a 33 megawatt hour system if we can only charge the storage from with electricity from the grid. And of course, here CapEx would further increase because the system would be larger. But then again, we would have slightly uh, lower steam costs and annual energy uh, bills. Now, coming to the interesting cases, as we saw before, coupling the thermal storage with on-site renewables, we've seen two cases, one in which we can only install solar uh, compared to the case in which we have slightly smaller solar plants combined with uh, wind power plants. And as you can see here, CapEx would, of course, uh, be significantly higher. But what's interesting is the effect that this would have on the steam costs and the annual energy related bills. So we can almost half the steam um, the steam costs compared to the case where we would have the low capex boiler solution coupled with grid electricity. Um, so just to wrap it up, uh, we've seen that process heat supply with thermal storage enables decarbonization for industry and gives access to predictable and often already very competitive energy prices. Um, the Lumenian solution offers a very high, uh, highly modular and very robust steel-based design that can be manufactured with local content and very easily be scaled up if needed. We've seen that if industry is not interested in taking on direct investments, we have alternative business models such as energy as a service, which would allow um, the production side to have very predictable, steady, long-term prices, both for their electricity and thermal energy needs. And maybe as a last note, we're more than happy to support your decision-making process with analysis, as we've shown before, of course, going a bit more into detail to the process specifics uh, on your sites, but making sure that we can assess properly assess costs and benefits of these kinds of setups. Um, so thanks a lot for your attention and uh, back to you, Chris. Well, thank you very much indeed, Maria, for a very enlightening presentation and very clear and uh, concise, uh, backed up by a great set of slides that I think are going to be studied uh, very carefully uh, by people who are facing this uh, current uh, cliff uh, by June uh, next year. You see, Yoko has really focused on what are we going to do about getting gas to South Africa, but we know that there is a gas gap, uh, and people have got to start looking at other solutions. Now, I'm sure not every uh, you know industry is, is going to have a solution that you are proposing, Maria. But there certainly uh, maybe some, uh, depending on the process heat requirements, depending on uh, you know the particular site and the particular process where energy storage uh, presents not only an opportunity to overcome the gas cliff but also a major decarbonization opportunity. And, uh, uh, and, and I think that's uh, you know, an aspect uh, which needs to be considered uh, as the carbon tax starts to ramp up, as the uh, cross uh, carbon border adjustment mechanisms start biting uh, in terms of products that are intended for export. Uh, these are additional uh, factors that come into uh, you know, the decision-making process and the economics and the business case for, for these solutions. So it's been really uh, fascinating uh, to, to hear your solution uh, of uh, combining, uh, you know, electricity supply from renewable energy with electricity supply from grid plus uh, thermal energy storage, uh, uh, you know, uh, looking at the particular needs of that process. So really interesting, and I hope that's going to stimulate a lot of thought and interest uh, in the uh, in the industry, uh, you know, as they grapple with the need to find solutions uh, to this gas cliff, uh, which was explained by Yako. 
Ladies and gentlemen and colleagues, it's really um, time now for a comfort break. Uh, it is basically 12 o'clock. We're five minutes over time, but that's not a problem. Um, and so I'm going to uh, call this comfort break and uh, ask you to return at 10 minutes past 12, uh, 12, 10. Uh, it's at the moment 12.59, uh, going on uh, 1300. It's 1300 now, so exactly at 10 minutes comfort break, and we'll get back to our next two presentations thereafter. Firstly, a presentation by Tiago Martins uh, Wilman from Siemens Energy in Brazil, uh, all the way in from Rio. Uh, and then finally, a presentation by Rosalind dos Santos uh, from Impact, who are a major uh, paper and packaging uh, company uh, and a user of, of process heat. So with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's call a break and let's be back here at 10 minutes past one. That is 13.10. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's exactly uh, 10 past one, 13.10. Uh, and that brings an end to our comfort break. Uh, it's great to have uh, such a good turnout to this webinar. And we've been honored by having some really great presentations today. Um, well, it's uh, now on to the second half of the, the webinar. And before I start, I'd just like to thank our presenters so far, and also to thank the presenters most sincerely for helping me with the Q&A text questions. So the presenters are uh, helping give you answers, uh, you know, as uh, this webinar proceeds. So please do keep your eye on the Q&A text facility where you will see some of your answer, your questions answered by our presenters uh, on that uh, text facility. This gives us more time uh, during the um, uh, Q&A for some verbal questions. So thank you very much to the presenters for that. So now it's uh, a pleasure to introduce you to our third uh, speaker, uh, who is Tiago Wilman. And he is uh, the head of the EAD uh, Heat Decarbonization Solutions at Siemens Energy in Brazil, uh, and he is dialing in from Rio de Janeiro. So big welcome to you, Tiago, all the way from um, uh, fr fr from uh, Brazil, as uh, we also welcomed uh, Maria uh, from Berlin in Germany. What a wonderful way of bringing together leading experts from around the world uh, to our audience. Tiago is an industrial engineer with an MBA in project management. And he's the global sales lead for heat decarbonization solutions in industrial customers at Siemens Energy EAD business unit. Tiago has 15 years experience in business development and management of engineering design projects and solutions for oil and gas, power generation, green hydrogen, and power to X markets in five continents. He's currently focusing on heat electrification and decarbonization technologies and solutions to support the energy transition. Tiago has also spent seven years working for government employers, such as the Engineering Council of Rio de Janeiro and uh, Flumens uh, Federal University. So with that, uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Tiago, and I'm now going to hand over to you to make your presentation. Great. Thanks a lot, Chris, for the opportunity. Uh, good afternoon to all the guys in the audience. So uh, let's talk a bit about fuel electrification. So first things first, uh, just a brief introduction to Siemens Energy. Probably many of you guys know the company already. Uh, we are responsible for a sixth of global electricity generation uh, based on our uh, technologies of uh, gas, gas turbines and, and all the electrical infrastructure on the high voltage and substations and transformers. We spend yearly over around billion euros on research and development. And part of what we'll be sharing today is based on this uh, R&D investment that is yearly assigned to new technologies and new solutions. We are present in more than 90 countries and we have around 97,000 employees working to energize society. So we are a big company. We are tracking all the requirements on the global energy transition. And uh, we are, of course, a technology company. So we talk about different verticals. Uh, here we have uh, customers on the utility side. So we work with power generation companies, but also a lot with the industry side. There is one specific organization inside Siemens Energy, which is a transformation of industry organization, where we deal with all the major verticals around the world. We have global coverage 
so from different verticals and also during all the product uh, product life cycle we work with products and parts long-term partnerships good service mod setups repairs and remote diagnose, diagnostics so uh, on the technology we work also on the service we work on operations so a very holistic offering to the customers and uh, a very wide range of technologies that we can provide for that so going to the main topic of our presentation, which is heat, uh, we see that when looking at the main contributors to the CO2 emissions in this row, our customers will see that electricity and heat, they are the biggest uh, consumers and the biggest in need for. So um, it, it's impossible to dissociate the carbonization from electricity and heat. But at the same time, when we look at heat, it's also difficult to dissociate it from electricity if we want to go on the electrical path for decarbonizing. We cannot deny that uh, when we look at these emissions and when we talk about heat, there's a, another topic that is about energy efficiency that needs to come together with that. So uh, there's a lot, there's a wide range of heat recovery solutions and heat recovery technologies that we need to bring to this discussion. So electrifying is a task, it's important, it will be there in the future, but also we need to consider that before thinking about generating uh, heat for new power, we need to think how can we utilize the existing waste energy that is currently existing in industrial players and how does that work in the future? So. I'm, I'm not talking about these heat recovery technologies. They are there, they are important, but today we'll be focused on the heat generation part of it. And when we look at the heat uh, that is utilized in the, in the industry today, for example, we see that uh, around 40% would be based on fuel for energy. And there's a very wide range of temperatures on which this heat is consumed. So uh, starting from the very low temperatures, which are, for example, for washing, for food preparation, but if you go to the upper uh, limits of temperature utilization, you see that there's a very, very wide range of applications that consumes temperature on a very high temperature. And then uh, how can we tackle all these different uh, requirements in the industry for very wide range of technologies and temperatures? And uh, we know, we see that there is not one uh, answer to that, but we need to think about different set of technologies and how to put them together. And uh, we are currently trying to see what we can do in terms of existing portfolio and of new technologies that can be developed. So uh, we have commercially available technologies who are out there to support. And if you look at Simmons Energy's uh, portfolio, we have the heat pumps, both for low temperatures and for high temperature. So uh, these are commercially available products. Uh, low temperature heat pumps are there for decades. So, so we have many of heat pumps, uh, low temperature heat pumps installed in, in customers. More recently, we have been working with what we call high temperature heat pumps, which work on a higher range of temperatures than the low temperature heat pumps. And then uh, these are applications that would be feeding, for example, for district heating applications, food and beverage markets, and pulp and paper customers. Uh, we can also think about associating different technologies. So, for example, a heat pump can be associated to a mechanical vapor recompressor to reach higher temperatures. If we're talking about steam, for example, uh, e boiler and e heaters are other technologies which are there that can also be put together on an integrated uh, solution for heat decarbonization. But if you look at the higher temperatures, if you want to tackle oil and gas, petrochemicals, chemicals applications, and up to cement and steel requirements, uh, we need to develop something new in terms of uh, technologies. There are some technologies that are fitting for those applications, but uh, they are very niche and still not so matured in terms of uh, technology readiness. And from our side, we also have some uh, ongoing developments. Uh, we have the turbo heater, which is uh, the equipment based on our turbine knowledge that we'll be working with increasing not only temperature, but also pressure in a specific fluid. And also working with a heater that can tackle higher temperatures and that uh, can be able to reach the cement and steel requirements on higher than 1,000 degrees Celsius applications. 
uh, heat storage will play a major role in that as well. So we cannot uh, consider that by utilizing renewable power to power electric uh, equipment, uh, it needs to have some kind of management. We need to ensure long-term utilization and steady operation of the electricity. And when we look at the technologies and the requirements for heat storage, you can see there's also plenty uh, range, a wide range of technologies that can be considered for those applications. So it's also part of the deal to select which is the best for each specific application. So different verticals will require different require, uh, technologies. And uh, storage is something that is still very, uh, very being discussed a lot because the, the technologies are there. If you look at the sensible heat technologies, there are very well uh, established technologies that can be worked. But sometimes we see that there are applications that existing technologies are still not uh, possible to, to tackle. So we need to think about other kind of heat storage like heat, latent heat, thermal chemical heat, which are technologies that are still early in development with uh, not so high technology readiness level, but still something that we need to, to take into consideration depending on the application. And it's also part of what we see that will be developing in the future and something that we are tackling from a solution standpoint. And, and, and why am I talking so much about solution? Because when you look at the heat electrification or heat decarbonization uh, projects and, and, and uh, how it moves forward, it's not just about defining the best technology. It's of course very important to know where to go, what uh, product or what storage system would be the best for the application of each customer. But um, if we don't understand the big picture, and it, sometimes it becomes very difficult first to have a, well, a, a good understanding of all the impacts it may, come, it may bring to, to one specific plant. And also we need to understand that it's not just about substituting electricity or, or natural gas uh, by electricity. We, if you look at the process side, of course, there's the impacts to the overall project process with the new technology. So it's not a, a straight uh, substitution of one equipment to the other. New equipment brings additional requirements on auxiliary systems or utilities or whatever. But at the same time, uh, we need to consider that there are processes out there that can uh, produce a higher yield of final product by having, for example, higher temperature or more stable temperatures in the process. And it brings additional revenues, not just by substituting the, the, the feedstock, but also with increased uh, productivity in the plant. And of course, it also brings a lot of modifications. We need to ensure that the, the appropriate systems are put in together and, and that they are considered in the overall picture. Electrification would play a major role in that. Uh, I've been talking to customers that were really concerned about the technology that they would be using to electrify their plant or to decarbonize their, their plant. But when they look at the required amount of power which will be required for that, they get really, really uh, surprised because substituting heat uh, for electricity or natural gas for electricity, it usually means that you need a very high output or very high power required. And in many customers, it may uh, mean that the existing power consumption of the plant as it is today will need to be even doubled or more than doubled just for one specific technology uh, to be electrified. And then that means that elect electrical system will play a major part in this uh, electrification and decarbonization switch. So we need to think that high voltage, medium voltage, and low voltage systems will need to be redesigned, they will need to be revamped and upgraded in a way to support all this uh, process of a new technology being installed at the, at the plant and power management as well. So we're talking about renewables, if you want to go green, if you want to decarbonize and how to manage green electricity appropriately to ensure that there's no outage or there's no lack of uh, of time in the plant that we keep the availability uh, in, in accordance to what it is today or even better. So really important to think about power management. Automation will put uh, all the 
uh, the, the process requirement into play. So automation is also very important. If you're talking about providing the right uh, utilities or the right product at the right place at the right time. So uh, it's really important to take automation into consideration. And again, the solution is what we think will be the important uh, part of it. Key set to success is to understand, uh, to have a complete understanding of process electrification and automation requirements. You need to have seamless integration of the new equipment with the existing infrastructure. Uh, I would say that the vast majority of the projects we've seen so far are brownfield projects, even though there are some greenfield out there, but it's more about customers who have a plant that they are running on, on coal or natural gas, they want to electrify. And we need to think that there is a plant up there. We cannot uh, just think about something new, which is very good, but it's not applicable to the customer's reality. And uh, we need to think that utility systems out there, auxiliary systems may exist in the plant. So we need to optimize their utilization to make sure that nothing is wasted and that we have the most optimized project. And by that, uh, we see that uh, what we call energy system design solution really need to be considered. It, it, there's a very wide range of technical uh, equipment that can be installed. We need to combine them with existing technology. So with gas boilers, with existing uh, power generation plants, be it closed cycle or open cycle. Electrolysis can be associated to such projects, uh, thermal storage, how to recover water, heat, and process gases which are existing in the, uh, on the ongoing process. Carbon capture, CO2 uh, management, for example, as, uh, how to store CO2 or how to recover and reutilize it on another part of the process. And the final utilization of uh, heat and the product that is being produced by the customers will also play a role. So there are so many different aspects to what we call a heat electrification solution that needs to be put into practice that uh, it needs to be put together in one single evaluation. You cannot go to one technology provider and ask for something, and then you go to a storage company and ask for another thing. It needs to be considered as a holistic approach. And uh, if it's not done like that, odds are that feasibility will be very hard to achieve. And then uh, if you think, for example, on the CBAM requirements that are upcoming, you need to be competitive. You need to make sure that you're not just decarbonizing your plant, but also that you have the most competitive price by the end of it. So uh, by optimizing and understanding all these technologies and optimizing the utilization of each of them, selecting the best technology, that's what will really bring uh, your product or your uh, process plant to the, the most optimized point. And then looking at a, a hybrid, uh, to a use case that we usually show that, of, of course, it doesn't mean all of this goes together in one single project, although it can happen. But what we say is that if you have an ongoing plant and you want to decarbonize, you want to go electrical, it doesn't need to be like switch everything off and plug something in, uh, which is new. A typical process that we see, the customer generates steam, burning natural gas or coal and then a gas boiler, it's generating CO2 and this steam is being utilized in the plant process standpoint. Uh, you can have uh, what we call a hybrid steam generation system. So for example, if there is availability of green electricity, you need to put additional electrical infrastructure. So from high voltage, medium voltage, and low voltage uh, standpoint, electrical equipment would be installed like an e-boiler or a heater to generate steam. This system can be put together with the existing plant, with the existing system. And then uh, if natural gas is available, you can burn it on the gas boiler. If natural gas is not available, or if it's more expensive than electrical power, you utilize our electrical power boiler uh, to produce the same steam. You have hybridization. You can play the best of each world whenever you need. At the same time, if you have to do some maintenance on each of the boilers, you have the other one to work in parallel. So you're also increasing availability on the process plant and uh, that means you can produce more by having this kind of flexible and hybrid uh, concept. 
uh, the scene we just produced can be stored on a skin accumulator, for example, and then you have uh, skin available if there's any kind of shortage. But what's more interesting is that if there's waste heat available in the plant, it can be associated to other technologies to generate more steam and you need less consumption of power or natural gas. And then it comes to energy efficiency topic that I was mentioning. We need to think how to utilize what is uh, wasted in the plant to ensure higher um, efficiency on the overall process. So if you can associate waste heat with a heat pump, or with a mechanical vapor compressor, it will generate more steam, it can accumulate more steam, and then utilize it on the, on the process. Yeah. We are also working on technologies that can generate uh, high pressure steam on the heaters, and then this high pressure steam can also be storage and heat storage systems. And whenever there's not electricity available, we can use this uh, high pressure steam for powering the steam turbine, and then we have additional green electricity, so increased flexibility on the existing plant. It's not just ensuring higher availability, but also ensuring that there's a high degree of flexibility on the plant. It ensures that you can have, for example, fast startup, a new boiler, for example, can be up and running in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 10 minutes, depending on the, on the, the boiler, but uh, it's really fast to be generating steam with an electric system. Uh, high power output. So here we can talk about equipment that are generated that that can run on 60 megawatt, 80 megawatt uh, thermal power. So very very high power uh, outputs on them. And also, uh, it can work on the grid balancing system. It, this kind of electrical system can work for uh, power management on grids. If there is like an excess of renewable power in the grid. We can start up the boiler and then we also have some kind of uh, energy arbitrage uh, revenue as an additional part of the business case if you need to consider that in places where it happens. So it brings a good amount of advantages, uh, supports the decarbonization journey if there's not uh, natural gas available, or if natural gas supply is not certain, it also brings an additional source for generating steam and making sure that the plant cannot go down because of the lack of, of input. And then uh, I think it's a very important time to reflect on our decarbonization targets and timelines. So if you run a, a process plant, if you have some kind of uh, decarbonization targets, uh, do you know what exactly they are? Do you know what it takes to be there? So uh, this is the time to to, to act. Uh, for example, take into the South African uh, reality, if there's no gas or if it's limited gas in the near future, and if you want to have some kind of solution that derives out of gas or to rely less on gas supply, the time to act is now. We need to be very urgent. We need to be aware that there's not much time left before we have our final measures and that we uh, know exactly where to go and, and what we need to do to ensure that operations are not uh, affected and that we uh, run in the production uh, of our plants in the appropriate way. So with that, I thank you very much for your time. I'll send it back to you, Chris. Tiago, thank you indeed. Coming in from uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, uh, giving us uh, a view. And uh, the thing I took away from this is that the real world, the real world is remarkably complex and requires uh, really integrated solutions uh, that look at the process holistically, uh, whether it's electricity, uh, whether it's water, whether it's gas, uh, energy in general coming from different sources, uh, both renewables and traditional and uh, so, yeah, this is a complex subject uh, and it's not just an off the shelf kind of a product that one installs, uh, but really a fascinating uh, view from um, Siemens Energy. And thank you very much, Tiago, for that input. Well, it's now on to our last presenter. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to Rosalind Dos Santos, Ros for short. Uh, she is the Group Energy Manager of Impact, 
Uh, and uh, impact is the impact group is a paper packaging and recycling company. She oversees the group consumption of electricity, gas, heavy fuel oil, coal, and all other energy forms. She's also develops and executes on the business case for renewable energy at impact. Uh, Roz has 16 years of experience working in the sustainability field and is an alumnus of the Future Energy Leaders Program of the World Energy Council. In 2020, uh, Rosalind was elected to the board of the South African National Energy Association, SANIA, and in 2024, she joined the Council of the Energy Intensive User Group, the EIUG, uh, which is a group of companies uh, that together account for more than 30% of the electricity consumption in South Africa. So Rosalind is also a certified energy manager with a BSc in chemical engineering and an MSc in metallurgical engineering from Wits University and an MBA for UCT. So she is talking to us today as an end user, uh, one of those companies uh, who presumably uses gas and is facing this gas cliff and has to explore alternative solutions, not only to face the gas cliff itself, but also, uh, you know, to lead the way in the decarbonization of impact. Uh, and so it's really important. We've had today, uh, you know, the first presenter from, uh, you know, the, the Industrial Gas Users Association uh, of South Africa, um, Yako, uh, Yako Human, who, who really outlined the situation with respect to gas and what we can expect in the, in the coming years. And that is a gap. Uh, we then went on to two technology providers, uh, looking at some of the solutions, the alternative solutions, uh, you know, to gas, uh, and noting that uh, that these are complex uh, environments uh, requiring a holistic uh, view. Uh, and now we move to a user, an end user of uh, process heat, uh, as well as an end user of electricity uh, and gas. Uh, and uh, we're really interested to hear the challenges that you're facing, Roz, and to hear how you perceive some of these solutions going forward, as I say, not just for the gas cliff, but also for the decarbonization of your business. Over to you, Roz. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Chris. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you. Perfect. And uh, thanks, everyone, for sticking around till the end and a few people for the kind messages. I received them. Um, Excited to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing with um, thermal energy use and decarbonization. And because of the theme of the webinar, I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about electricity and our scope too. I'll give you a little bit of an overview of impact um, because we're one of those big listed companies that people just don't know. Um, tell you about our energy use, um, decarbonization, and then some of our thoughts in thermal energy and what we're thinking of doing going forward. So yeah, this is uh, Impact. We have uh, 40, over 40 sites um, between Namibia, South Africa, and Mozambique. Uh, we've got a paper division, a corrugated division, a plastics division, and we're the largest recyclers in South Africa. Um, when our friends don't know who Impact is, I ask them to go to the cupboard under their sink, which is generally where you keep all your cleaning chemicals, and start turning things over. And you'll see we make the vanish bottles. If you go to your pantry, we make packaging for Nestle, for, for Unilever. Um, but most of the time, we're sort of B2B. Another point, you'd actually like touch our products as we make a lot of the take-a-lot boxes. So we we present in many, many sort of stages and we're quite integrated along the value chain and quite proud of being a very large business operating as a circular economy business. I've put our 2023 performance and you'll see we're working quite hard on um, reducing our energy intensity. Uh, we've got a lot of solar PV installed behind the meter. At the moment, we're sort of just over 50 megawatts um, combined demand from all of the 40 sites. We're at 16 megawatt peak now, and we'll have 25 megawatt renewable energy installed behind our meters by 2027. We're always pushing recycling water efficiency, and we're driving strong emission reduction targets sort of on the back of our energy reduction targets. 
I put in our uh, solar PV facility at Springs. So that's our latest one at some um, 5.4 megawatt peak. Uh, we build it all ourselves with our own team. We do our own design, our own procurement. We do oversight of the construction um, and commissioning. And then we bring it into use and operate and maintain ourselves. And uh, we're looking to build an even bigger one next time. Uh, next to our solar PV, you'll also see our spring CDC yard, and that's all recycled paper and RCF. That's going to our mills and to other sort of RCF users in, in the circular economy. We use a lot of our energy when you look at the actual energy balance in terms of gigajoules. It's, it's thermal fuels and it's fossil fuels at the moment. However, when we actually look at what it's costing us, and this is the 2023 data, so all of us will know how bad sort of load shedding and grid interruptions were in that year. So electricity is even showing a lower percentage than is usual for the split. Most of our costing is actually electricity. So traditionally, a lot of our energy projects were focused on this. But we're seeing more and more that um, we're getting far above inflation increases, not just on electricity, but on a whole range of, of thermal fuels. And I've put in like our 2019, which is our baseline year for targets, versus the 2023 costs. These are H1 costs, so they go up to June. So probably a little bit understated because we don't have the full impact of the winter tariff um, for electricity there. But you can see sort of the, the rate of increase that we've seen from 2019 to 2023. Um, so yeah, while thermal fuels provide around 70% of our energy requirements, they contribute only around 30% to, to our total energy costs. I've also taken our full 2023 um, footprint, excuse me, <coughs> I have a small cough and I did take cough mixture before I started, but uh, apologies. The 2023 um, full uh, mostly scope one and scope two um, carbon footprint. In theory, there'll be a little bit of scope three there for LPG cylinder use in um, rented forklifts versus own forklifts, et cetera, et cetera. But mostly that's our scope one and scope two footprints. And I was looking at what we could do um, in our own efforts, as well as with wheeling renewable and green energy over the grid to go down towards a lower emissions business. And bearing in mind that we've already brought in a fair amount of renewable energy behind our own meter, we could probably do another 30% of scope one and scope two em emission reductions with energy efficiency and solar. Um, and I took this at about 10% for, for energy efficiency and thermal fuels. We ran um, yearly a best boiler competition. And for this year past and the year before, the winner actually achieved and sustained savings of 15% below the baseline. And we run it on a rolling baseline. So definitely there is always energy efficiency. There is always opportunities for improvement. And it's 100% the first fuel. We must look there because those are our best return projects. And then bringing into, into use and into operation more solar, solar on our rooftop and solar sitting behind our meters, um, trying to cover the areas of our roof spaces and our factories as much as possible, taking us down to sort of yet another 30%. Then, depending on how we look at how energy is going to wheel over our grid and a more competitive electricity market in the future, you can go very, very like deep into decarbonization and renewable energy certificates and assume that we're going to wheel a lot of energy. But there is perhaps a little bit of risk because when is the way that sort of the wheeled energy consolidation on bills going to change? Are we always going to be consolidating monthly or are we going to start consolidating in smaller intervals? And if we start consolidating in smaller intervals, we could have some stranded power that we're not able to use within, say, the 30 minutes, uh, half hour interval. So how should we go to net zero? Um, how do you do it for, for a business that has uh, both uh, electrical and thermal energy demand? Um, should we go like big into battery storage and go into electric boilers? Should we look at alternative ways to raise steam? Um, should we look at hydrogen? And I think all of these things, it's, it's a combination of technologies. 
Um, yeah, because um, as you say, we are also definitely exposed to to the sasol gas um, supply cliff. Um, we are quite concerned about it. Um, some of the areas that we use gas, we use gas to raise steam and saturated steam. So they will probably have to shift to another fuel, um, be it probably HFO or coal, depending on what sort of the costs the plant can actually take in terms of costs of goods sold. But we do have one use where we actually can't use a fuel other than gas. So we'll probably have to go to an LPG or an LNG. Um, our machine just runs too fast to de to run the coating drying with any other fuel. More than that, we we operate in sort of an, an interconnected world. Um, we've already experienced on our site some, some climate risks and some extreme weather events. Uh, we've seen localized flooding and a bank from one of our, our factories collapse into, into the factory production area. Um, we managed to recover in a week and now we're rebuilding the retaining wall with our neighbors. But I think we're going to see more and more of this. And it just talks about sort of the imperative that, that we need to, to act. There's also definitely a social license to operate, um, even beyond the carbon border adjustment mechanism or CBAM that we've been talking about a little bit in the session. Um, and then we've also seen sectoral emission targets being discussed sort of in line with a 1.5 or 2 degrees target world. So taking that back to our context and sort of thinking about what we need to do to, to make sure that we have the ability to continue to be a responsibly operating company in this new environment. So taking it a little bit further into some opportunities. I wanted to talk about the, the benefits of having combined heat and power. And it's something that we see at, at Condo, um, which is the new name for Petri Teef. Um, we've recently done a refurb on our back pressure turbine, and we run the turbine such that we can take the exhaust steam directly into the drying section of, of the paper machine. And that makes a huge difference both to our electricity costs as well as to the overall efficiency of of the whole process and extracting as much energy from the fossil fuels that we can get as possible. Another project that we worked on for years and years, but is currently on, on ice um, because we're actually doing a bigger um, sort of core business upgrade at the Mkondo Mall um, is waste to energy, where we could take sort of the fibers that we can't take in around in our process anymore times and we estimate we take one paper fiber around six to seven times before it's too small and too short to actually cross hatch and have the strength that we need for paper and there are reports sort of in in the sludge that's um entrained with water you can't push it to more than like 50 percent dry so we're looking at a solution for that with a lot of the bale contamination that comes in with RCF, which is usually about 10 to 15% of the volume. And it's a highly mixed, highly contaminated plastic stream that isn't suitable, suitable for higher value recycling and the other recycling that we do in our business. Um, it's something that we, we look at and we're going to start updating year on year on year, but it is a high capex project. It is um, high risk. And we need to find exactly sort of the right environment and hopefully the right partner to, to go into implementation with. But one of the key things about waste to energy is we'll also use both a thermal and an electrical offtake, um, as well as have good sort of feed security because a lot of the material that we'll be feeding with will be our own. Next, we can maybe start saying, well, well, how about we fuel switch? Um, and some of the quick and easy sort of fuel switch opportunities are often to say, okay, like let's let's just do biomass, let's do renewable biomass. And I put this picture in from the Bioenergy Atlas for South Africa, mostly because it's really, really beautiful. Um, but also because as a very water scarce country, we do not have an abundance of biomass. Um, and if anybody is going to go extensively into biomass, there'd need to be sort of a dedicated energy crop that's grown for this power generation to make sure that it is properly sustainable. Um, that's, that said, we do look for opportunities to take biomass residues um, into our process to reduce coal consumption. But those residues are sort of 
bark and twigs and smaller parts of the process that we're not going to take through as a fiber into actual paper production, which we see as, as quite a high value use as a paper company versus incinerating for, for energy purposes. <laughs> Next, and I saw there was even a question in the chat about uh, solar heat for industrial processes. Um, this is incredible technology, and I would uh, encourage anybody to, to look into it, especially when you've got low-grade heat requirements. This is something that we, we looked at um, for uh, our, our PET plant, recycled PET plant. Um, we took it all the way into sort of business case uh, development. Uh, we were getting approvals and then our plant actually closed because of international pet pricing, um, nothing to do with this project. But we had huge potential here to start um, using solar heat to heat water to 85 degrees. And we're using this 85 degree water to wash off the PET and also to heat up the caustic. We were doing it most of the time with heat pumps and we were um, harvesting some of our waste heat from our compressors into, into the heat pumps, but then there was electrical resistance heating for the top heat for the for the top up heating to make sure that the baths always stayed at 85 degrees to make sure we made a food safe product product that could go into bottle to bottle recycling. And we found that there was great potential. So we did this work in 2019. Um, we took in grant funding of around 15% of, of the project costs. We did the costing at 500 euros per meter squared and provided you've got land area for the collectors and you've got sort of, if you're going to put it on the roof, the structural holding capacity to hold it because water is heavy. Um, we took 40% flat plate um, efficiency, collector efficiency, which is um, pretty pretty standard and well known for the, for the technology. Um, and then the irradiance for the site in Springs where we were considering it. And this project came in at a payback of roughly three years. So, <laughs> sorry, I would highly um, recommend that anybody that's uh, working in this sort of space and has this sort of low-grade heat requirement, please look at this technology. Next. I put this in because I've stood I've stood next to these Kalmak tanks before in Namshanga and watched them sweat in our Durban humid heat. And this technology is implementable. It's absolutely possible. <coughs> Sorry. And um we can definitely put this into operation now. An interesting thing about this sort of cold energy storage is you do use more energy in kilowatt hours to make this colder chiller water versus just making it at any point in time because of the losses and because of sort of the, the radiation and convection that you get over long periods of time. But because of sort of a time of use tariff structure, it can be a fantastic energy project, both in terms of sort of managing demand as well as... <coughs> generating large savings that you need. And I've been considering this for a while and seeing what the applications are for the plastics industry, where we use chilled water in our molds to um, basically increase cycle times and, and sort of reduce the sweating that you get and the quality issues that go along. Taking it back more into what we've chatted about today um, and possibly also why I'm on here, we have been chatting with Luminian trying to get sort of a, a business case on the table to understand what sort of thermal storage could do for us. We still have a long way to go in terms of overbuilding our renewable energy behind the meter, if that's what we were going to do with the excess electricity, or else signing up wheeled energy, um, hopefully solar and wind, to come in with quite a nice profile to create this thermal energy. But should all of our excess energy, when we get to the point when we have it, should it go into batteries or should it go into thermal storage? <coughs> Furthermore, will hydrogen have a role in industrial heat for decarbonization or only in transportation? At the moment, we're mostly looking into hydrogen for mobility applications, but it definitely could 
be broader, especially if there's more technology change and opportunity. Um, and definitely my co-presenter from Seaman showed sort of a very, very full picture of where everything could come from. So what does this mean for us um, going forward? So we would like to test new technologies now in modular approaches to be ready for a transition global energy economy. We would look for good opportunities like our solar heat for industrial processes, where we could co where we could cooperate and collaborate with experts in the industry, and then we were working with the CSIR and Fraunhofer, um, and then it came with a portion of grant funding as well as technology and skills transfer. But we'd look into partnerships with people that know technology as well. We'd look how it could be funded and what sort of innovative funding there is for decarbonization, what regulatory incentives we could apply to our projects and whether we could get these approved. We also are looking from the sidelines to see what happens when CBAM expands to products beyond the current seven. We do have um, clients that e export mostly agricultural sector and fruit in, in our boxes, but CBAM could have some sort of exposure for our business as well and, and all other businesses. Carbon price adjustments. At the moment, we're paying our carbon tax on sort of 20 to 30% of our scope one emissions because of the tax-free thresholds in the design. But we're coming to the end of the first phase and we're watching eagerly to see what happens with the tax-free thresholds because this type of economic measure could really, really change the economics of a lot of these projects and a lot of the decarbonization projects. Um, battery energy storage. The question is, it always going to be cheaper to store heat versus storing electricity? <coughs> waste to energy, as mentioned, um, we'll continue to work on this, continue to update it. We know there's a business case here, but the investment is huge and the risk is huge, the, the technology risk is huge. So we'd look also to partner to try and reduce that and keep sort of looking at when is the right point to implement, to deliver this good solution, which would also have quite nice baseload electricity, which might work quite well in terms of managing the variability of some of our renewable energies. And then as a, an end thought, I put uh, carbon capture and storage. Um, I think it's it's not expected to, to become uh, the most commonplace technology, but a lot of people are investing and looking into it. Will it be so usual that we're capturing and storing carbon via through direct air capture or capturing carbon at sort of carbon negative sites? that are, are really pre creating sort of eco and, and industrial and, and air and industry services. And will our carbon removals come from this? I don't think so, but I think we must keep looking at it because always the solution to these things is a suite of technologies and not just one option. So yeah, that's, that's me. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. It was a little bit of a tough one to, to give you an, an overview, but this is what we're doing and this is how we're thinking about it. And I must give thanks to Faith Mayisa. She's my colleague and she works on a lot of the data with me. So some of these graphs we did together. Uh, Jane Maloney, CEO of PAMSA and always supportive um, of me. And uh, Mike Levington, who was the first person that gave me a call and said, would I talk on, on this webinar with Chris? So yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Roz. Uh, and, and also for giving credit to... Uh, those players behind the scenes that uh, stir me into action. Uh, I need it sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, there, there are people behind the scenes that are giving me ideas and thoughts about, uh, uh, you know, what, what are the key topics that we need to address? And you've touched on some of these key persons. It's great to see some of the industry associations uh, like PAMSA, the Paper Manufacturers Association of South Africa, uh, and, and also... Um, uh, you know, organizations like Iguata, uh, the, the industrial gas users also playing an industry role. And, and I know you're speaking not only in your uh, capacity as impact, but also uh, as a participant, an industry participant, you know, in the pulp and paper and packaging in industries. So it's, 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 it's really what is needed, as I think uh, Jaco pointed out, that ultimately industries have got to act together because if we wait always for government, we could be waiting 
uh, for too long a time, uh, and and people have to be proactive uh, in in these circumstances. Also, was I must say, uh, Ros, it's absolutely fantastic to see uh, you know the, the amount of work in the energy sector that a company like Impact and an industry like the pulp and paper industry do in the field of energy management. Uh, and, and, and not just energy management, but uh, decarbonization, the efforts that you're putting in, that your company is putting in, that your industry is putting in, uh, is, is truly impressive. Uh, and, and is a lesson, I think, for many companies who kind of only move, uh, you know, when, when there's an absolute crisis. So this forward thinking view that you have, your company has, is really quite quite an inspiration. Ladies and gentlemen, that comes to the end of four fantastic uh, presentations, which I think has given us a lot of uh, food for thought. And I again must thank um, the presenters for answering so many of the, the questions. Uh, there are also some unanswered questions, which we're going to touch on. Uh, but I was interested, uh, Roz, in your uh, comments about concentrating solar uh, uh, plant, uh, you know, for heat um, uh, uh, you know, for 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 from direct solar heating uh, and and storage, thermal energy storage in an industrial application as opposed to a utility application. And I think for utility applications, concentrating solar plants have uh, had less of a interest compared to uh, solar PV. Uh, but you've pointed out that there, this is something that should definitely be looked at for perhaps lower temperature applications uh, in, in industry. And I want to put this question to Thiago. Uh, and Thiago, I saw a presentation not so long ago uh, about what Siemens Energy were doing in the field of industrial uh, heat uh, from concentrating solar plants, direct solar heating uh, of, of some kind of a uh, liquid, uh, whether it's water, whether it's uh, some salt, electrolyte, uh, and then storage, thermal storage, and then but uh, can you tell us where Siemens Energy are in this business uh, of concentrating solar plant for process heat uh, that Roz described as a very exciting and interesting option? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, we are currently looking at two very different technologies. So uh, there's uh, there are parallel work streams in Siemens Energy about this subject. There are some things that we are evaluating internally, as I said. This was a pilot plant that, uh, if I'm not wrong, our friends from Siemens de Mesa were working uh, with the CSP plant. We are also working with partners. So we usually, I mean, if you get back to that slide that I was showing, there are a very wide different uh, storage applications. So we cannot have all of them inside the company. So we are also working with partners who are very specific in some of these technologies. And internally, uh, we think of, uh, of course, uh, other things. If we're not talking about heat, for example, batteries is also something that the, the company is looking for. So and the, 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 the answer is that we are trying to tackle as much as we can. Of course, we'll not be able to give all the answers from our own portfolio. Sometimes a specific solution will require technology that we don't own. But uh, we see this as, as a very important topic. If you're trying to manage uh, renewables, we need to think about storage. And that's definitely something to be seen in the future. Thanks very much uh, for that, uh, Tiago. Uh, and I, I want to go now to Yako, if uh, you can handle this one, Yako. And, then, and that is, you know, on this gas cliff that we've talked about, I, I remember after our previous webinar where you spoke and we really raised this gas cliff uh, high on the public agenda. Uh, there were some soothing remarks thereafter by our Minister of Resources and Energy, uh, basically indicating, don't worry, things are under control. And that there are, uh, you know, you know, initiatives, uh, government initiatives and others that make this not a problem. And I think a discussion I held with you not so long ago, uh, you know, you suggested that the only uh, sort of thing that you kind of saw on the table was uh, some political pressure on Sassel to extend this deadline uh, beyond uh, June uh, 2026. But I, I want to just ask you from a gas supply point of view, 
uh, what, what is on the table actually from government? And, and I think you've indicated on the table from the private sector that they're kind of reaching the stage where they think they just have to look after themselves. You know, we can't wait for government solutions. So can you just paint the picture of where things are in reality? Cut out the hype, cut out the smooth talk uh, and just uh, put the cards on the table very frankly. I think, Chris, what South Africa needs now is not patriarchy. We 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 need solutions, you know. And um, industry now is at a juncture where, number one, all fixed capital investment has been halted. Right? So there's no investment plans for those that were there were in any event put on, on hold. So so that is that is the first point or the first indications that things are not well. The moment these investments start to flow, whether it's uh, plant expansions, um, furnace lines, production, all these things, of course, the the that that would be indicative that things that the outlook uh, uh, is improving. Mm. Right now, what industry is faced with is it is it has made the decision to actually pick up the ball and run with it. We've referred to that in our in our talk earlier with the audience, where we said, well. Industry is now actually going to aggregate and form the marketplace for for this for these future gas investments and infrastructure and things that need to take place. It's not because we want to, it's because we have to. I mean, these these are typically investments and considerations that um, that that takes place in in what we refer to as the network economy, um, and typically where the state fulfills a role. So right now, that is where industry is finding itself. What is critical for us is, as we've indicated, is bridging this gap, this uh, this dead zone, which is pretty much an eighteen month um, uh, 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 period. Rosalind, if, you know, as as a manufacturer, would would know what implications would be for no gas in their operations, particularly at the volume that industry consumes it. So, Cecil, and we are in. In, in conversation with Cecil to see if there are any other technical means that could be employed in order to carry us for another 18 or 24 months. It would appear that there are solutions in terms of uh, uh, infilling and drilling and compression of the, the, the gas reserves, but we don't know to what extent, uh, and, and that is where we, we, we now touching base with Cecil. So if anything, Cecil would be in a position to carry us for, for another another few months. From mm -hmm. a government perspective, we simply don't know where we stand, uh, despite despite all the um, uh, discussions, the hype, uh, the the, uh, <laughs> the commentary that, that that's been made. Clearly, the gas master plan is not addressing these issues, um, these pertinent issues that we face. So, so we're not sure what is what is happening in that space. We know where we stand with the the um, incumbent supplier of gas, and industry knows where it stands in terms of what needs to be done. Um, so that's that's the that's the reality we have. Yeah, thanks for your very frank uh, assessment there. Uh, if I may address this one to Maria, Maria, I know I think this was answered on the chat, and. Um, uh, but I just want to extend the question a little bit further. Uh, the question that was asked in the chat, and I think was answered, it, you know, what storage media are you using for thermal storage? And I think, you, but you can correct me, that your answer was steel. Uh, but are you looking at other storage medium like uh, graphite, uh, rocks, <laughs> sand? Um, I don't know. It's, you know, all the different options that were, you know, listed uh, in one of the presentations. What else are you doing uh, and what other storage options, storage media options are you looking at at um, Lumenia? Mm. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for for the question, also for expanding it. So, uh, of course, before choosing steel, we, we did have a, a very intense look at other materials. And uh, we, we actually went for this material for for the reasons that I that I listed in the in the presentation, we think that it's a very robust uh, material. It's very well known and it's very easy to manufacture the way we design it, uh, has a high resid uh, residual value and has very good thermal properties. So this is ultimately all the reasons why we went for steel. Of course, we also have a very extensive R&D pipeline and I'm hoping that uh, by next year, maybe we can uh, have another, an another chat and maybe talk about the different design and different material for our storage. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks uh, for that. Uh, and um, I'm just trying to see here. Oh, yes, this one I want to address to Roz. Uh, Roz, you talked about, um, and by the way, presenters, can you all switch on your cameras? It's nice to see all of you as we're having this chat. Uh, but Roz, we, we, we spoke, you, you spoke about electrification behind the meter. Um, and that this would, uh, you know, be, uh, you know, play an interesting role. Uh, but you also spoke about, uh, you know, electricity wheeled in to the site, um, uh, either, you know, through bilateral wheeling arrangements or or even trading, uh, trading arrangements of electricity. Obviously, that would, you know, if you're using that uh, wheeled electricity or traded electricity to, uh, you know, to supplement the heating uh, processes is going to increase the power supply overall requirement. So it's not just using the existing power supply, but would would need to expand it quite significantly to make a big difference. Uh, uh, and and so I, I just wanted to get a further sort of elaboration from you on 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 in your business uh, and in the you know displacement of of gas for heat with uh, electricity for heat from external sources, uh, wheeling and trading. Is this wheeling and trading a big part of your plans going forward? Thanks. Sure. So, so we're very keen on the behind the meter kilowatt hour. Um, we know that's the cheapest kilowatt hour we ever going to get. Um, and we're fortunate to live in, in a sunny, sunny country. Um, we're also lucky to already be in the second phase in a rollover of a wheeling agreement. Um, and we've been wheeling base load renewable energy for a couple of years now. Um, but but excited to to get more into it. Um, and I think there's a huge opportunity for us in wind and for the solar that cannot fit behind our meter or on our rooftops um, in having this this power delivered to us. Um you're right to highlight that we need to overbuild to to quite an extensive amount um, to start raising steam from electricity and start substituting the uses of gas. Um, our one gas use is not substitutable at all with sort of the constraints that we have at the moment because of the speed that the machine needs to run. Um, so there even switching directly to electric sort of infrared drying, we just won't get the drying quickly enough for the coating to, to dry before we need to wind um, and sort of finish finish the paper production. So there definitely is still like an absolute um, space for gas. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult one to say. So we are, we're pro energy and we're pro emission reductions. Um, we try to always contract in the most sensible way, bearing in mind that we're listed and using sort of financial resources responsibly. Um, we have not set sort of a, a net zero target yet um, because we don't set targets that we can't achieve. We set ambitious targets that we have to work hard to achieve. Um, but but we make sure that we have plans because we don't like to say, well, well, we haven't done it. So I've given you a range of, of how we think about it, but I can't say we've got uh, one answer yet. Mm -hmm. um, and then if I can just jump on to the previous one, we've actually also got um, our B entity, Delisu, that makes high uh, purity sodium sulfate. So anybody looking at storing energy in that format, uh, please yeah, give, give them a shout. Um, it's the same sort of pu purity quality that you would need for a CSP plant. And we have that being manufactured locally now. Hmm. Interesting. And I see, Yako, your hand is up there. Is there something you would like to come in on? Just to add to what Rosalind's saying, I can I can certainly attest that there is not one large manufacturer in this country which is not which is primary ambition or strategy is not to decarbonize. Right? And this comes from local shareholders, from global shareholders where these companies have local and, 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 and global footprints. Now, the reality in South Africa is, is that our industries need to deal with the, with the cards that they are being dealt with or, or that have been dealt them. So, so there's a certain and very peculiar and particular reality in South Africa, which, which implores us to follow certain pathways, which is not, in our, my opinion, not certainly not 
the uh, the textbook for decarbonization. But we've got to balance that with, of course, our socioeconomic imperative in this country, which is a developing country. So it 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 is it is a very much a balancing act. Um, but I can assure you, from a strategic and ambition and and um, uh, perspective, I mean, decarbonization is top priority. Mm. Uh, Yaka, while I've got you uh, on the line, uh, but maybe I can address this one to you as well. Look, I'm told that this gas cliff has been on the cards for many, many years. And there is some uh, criticism of industrial gas users, uh, you know, for sitting around thinking that somebody else is going to solve their problem for them. And finally waking up to the fact that they have to solve this problem themselves. Uh, and now they're faced with a degree of crisis uh, management. Uh, would you go along with that assessment uh, that uh, the, the industry has been too slow to, to react to what has been inevitable uh, and the decarbonization imperative has also become uh, inevitable? So, really, uh, your comments on, on the, the role of gas users themselves in dealing with their own problem. Correct. I, I, I think... If you ask me, industry has been too slow to, to respond to this. The reality is, is that industry is now having to adopt a world which typically is provided by governments or states. Mm -hmm. This is equivalent to industry having to build its own distribution networks, its own power generation facilities, and and almost source its own. So it 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 really is. It it compels industry to move into again what I refer to as the network economy. Those basic services for uh, that are basically required from the state. And you know, have we been too slow? Have we been too naive? Absolutely. Are we trying to deal with this reality? Yes. Um, is it our comfort zone? Certainly not. This is not what we do on a daily basis. Yeah, thank you. Maria, if I can just move to you um, and, and ask regarding the application of steel as a as your choice for the moment of, of storage media, uh, what is the temperature range that you're kind of focusing on for, for your technology? Obviously, you know, I think it's been, the point has been made several times that there is not one solution for all. Uh, and that uh, there are various areas for different solutions. So can you tell us clearly where your solution fits in in terms of the pressure, uh, the temperature range uh, of your solution and, and the application area of your solution? Sure, yeah. So in terms of supply temperature of what we can deliver as an output, we can go as high as um, 450 degrees Celsius, uh, which means that the internal storage core temperature can go up to 600. So in terms of supply temperature, 450. And uh, the sort of application that this can cover uh, varies, of course, very significantly. Uh, it goes across all sectors. But as we've seen, uh, very promising sectors are pulp and paper, food and beverage, and chemicals. Um, and in terms of different kinds of solutions that can cover these ranges, uh, we have, of course, different technologies. But even within the thermal storage sector, of course, we can go for different options. And I think um, it's it's a very, very huge market. So we're actually very glad to see a lot of movement and a lot of traction in the thermal storage um, market and to see that, that there are very different designs and solutions because I think at the end of the day, it's a case-specific decision whether, for example, steel is the right call or maybe another material. Um, but I think mm -hmm. that there is uh, quite enough to do in that uh, regard. And I'm happy to see a lot of companies moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maria. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I would like to sort of open this up now uh, and again thank the presenters for answering uh, uh, most of the questions that have been put. And if they could also look at some of the others that have not yet been answered. Uh, but I'd like to move to the hands up situation and ask any of the presenters uh, who, who would like, uh, sorry, any of the participants, the attendees, who would like to ask a question verbally to put up your hand. I will see your hand up. And I will then transfer the microphone to you where you can pose your question to one of the presenters. And I see immediately three hands have shot up. So that's great. Um, and the first one I'm going to move to is Clyde and Mallinson. And Clyde, I'm allowing you to talk now. Uh, please switch on your microphone and pose your question. Thanks. 
Uh, thanks very much, Chris, thanks and much thanks much to much all the presenters for a really, really good presentation um, or good presentations. The question I want to ask is that when we move to a new renewable energy future, we will de facto have surplus energy for much of the time. And I'm really excited to see that this can now be coupled with thermal storage in order to provide uh, thermal heat for thermal heat processes. So I don't know if it's, if anyone would like to comment on that, that, that we will de facto have surpluses that need to be absorbed, as it were, um, mm -hmm. um, in different forms of storage. And putting mm -hmm. it into heat storage and then using it as heat, as opposed to trying to turn it back into electricity, just makes so much sense. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you entirely, Clyde, that sometimes people talk about surplus electricity from solar PV during the day as some kind of a problem. You know, when in actual fact, I think it represents a fascinating opportunity. And the point you've made is that converting that uh, surplus uh, electricity from solar PV directly into process heat uh, you know, is more efficient and uh, more economical. Uh, then turning it uh, uh, into a battery and storing electricity and then back again. So uh, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. But I'd like to put this to Tiago and, and ask uh, your, your view on this question of what you might call, I think Clyde often calls super energy or super electricity, electricity that comes at zero cost effectively and, and is treated by many as a problem when in actual fact it's an opportunity for all kinds of businesses. Yeah, and that's correct. It's, it's a problem if we don't know how to manage it, right? So we have seen some time that, uh, in the past that there are disruptions to the, to the electrical system because there's too much renewable power and we don't know how to manage. And, uh, yeah. and it's important to have ways to store this. And it's not just about heat. Uh, you need to think, for example, is it better to store power as power on batteries? Is it better to store power as heat? We can think of other things like hydrogen. So there is a, a wide pos a range of possibilities in terms of how to store this excess power. Uh, the best, the, the, the right thing to say to or to think is uh, how to manage this and, and, and how to determine when and how to have this storage made in the best way. So uh, again, being, having so many different technologies and applications for this access uh, electricity gives us a wide range of opportunities and it's important to know exactly what to do with it because wasting it is really a sin, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I quite agree. Uh, and uh, we need to avoid this wastage of energy. I see uh, at the big Skytech plant that's been recently commissioned, which is a solar PV and battery energy storage, a very significant amount of energy is being curtailed at a time when we have electricity shortages. Uh, it seems to be some kind of a madness. But anyway, um, I, I see another hand up from uh, Fricky Buerta. Uh, Fricky, I'm going to allow you to talk now. Uh, please switch on your microphone and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Fricky, thanks. Yes. Um, uh, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation, all of you. Um, I, this question is probably uh, directed to the ladies. Um, um, I, I'm very much interested in what the capital cost per kilowatt hour would be for the thermal energy storage. And my second question would be, at what point would thermal energy storage actually be cheaper than thermal chemical uh, energy storage technologies? Thanks. Maria, I know your presentation had a lot uh, about okay. some of the costs, and, and I know you've modeled this, and uh, it's part of the evaluating the business case of each particular installation. And I'm sure it's not an easy uh, thing to just give a quick answer to, because it must vary considerably depending on the applications and the temperatures and all of that. But can you give it a crack, Maria? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> this question is a very popular one, so <laughs> we're very prepared for this. Uh, so as you said, it highly depends on, on the process that we're looking at, but also uh, at the supplier landscape in a specific region where we're implementing the project. Uh, but what we've seen so far in the markets that we're targeting, which is mostly in Europe and the US so far, but we already started looking also at some specific cases in South Africa, we can cover a range of somewhere between 
175 to 250 euro per kilowatt hour, um, which we would then, of course, have to translate into regional prices and currencies. But this is more or less the range of capex that we cover. Thank you, Miria, for tackling a difficult question so effortlessly. <laughs> I think it would have stumped me. Uh, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, there are two other uh, hands up that I'm going to take, and then I'm going to call it a day. Uh, and the, the first one is from uh, Bekia uh, Kambwa. Uh, Bekia, uh, I'm switching on. I'm allowing you to talk now. Please switch on your mic and ask your question. Uh, good day, panel, and uh, thanks for a really uh, academical and <laughs> really, really mot motivational uh, presentation uh, and seeing where the technology is heading. Uh, I've got, I've got uh, one question. I've got one question, and this is uh, specifically uh, for us in, in, in South Africa. I see the technology when it comes to, to heat, uh, heat uh, what's called heat storage and all those things, it, it's, it's well, it's, it's all well. Uh, now taking it back into power, not not just uh kilowatts in in heat. Uh, I think that will be more preferable. And when we talk about all this uh excess energy, uh, is this not a a matter of over design and not looking and not look and not doing a proper grid assessment or proper feasibility? Uh, study prior to construction. Why will one uh, have access and meaning it's over design? It's over design, and uh, looking at the budget or capex that is going to go into the project. Why will one do such, knowing that we're not feeding yet into the grid? <laughs> Well, it's a very interesting question. I, I, I must say that in the world, the new world of renewable energy. Um, it is not over designed to have surplus energy during certain peak times of the day. Uh, it is just acknowledged that that is an outcome. And in a way, it's a very desirable outcome because it's going to mean, you remember, of course, that the price of uh, solar PV, the energy cost of it is zero. So, um, the, you know, the fact that you're producing electricity in a surplus means you can sell it at zero cost. And in fact, some markets, even the price has gone negative. But uh, look, I don't think it's a question of over-design. I think it's what you need to do sometimes to achieve the objective. Uh, and you are left with surplus energy that can be very usefully used uh, for all kinds of uh, applications, such as thermal storage and supplying process heat to industry. But... Uh, Tiago, uh, what do you have to say to the, to the idea that that this uh, that, that producing surplus electricity during certain times of the day is uh, is not is a sign of bad design? Yeah, and we need to consider the fact that uh, if we think about a future based on renewable power, renewable power is intermittent, right? So we cannot have uh, this available. For example, we cannot have solar when it's during night, or we cannot have wind if it's not blowing. And this kind of over design and storing the power which is produced during the peak time is more a, a thing about appropriate management of the power rather than over design. And if you talk to a utilities company, they would be thinking about a certain way to store this power. And if you talk to an industrial customer, it's a completely different approach. Because typically the utilities company, they want to have power available during the biggest amount of time possible. And sometimes the industrial customer, they just want to make sure that the process is not disrupted by not having steam or by not having some kind of uh, process requirement to their plan. So uh, these, uh, these two different worlds will exist, will coexist, and it will be up to each of these uh, worlds to define how to store and how to manage the power, but it's definitely not oversight. Yeah, I, I agree you. with you. Uh, the, the key, of course, is storage. Uh, there'll be times during the day when there's surplus, and there'll be times during the day when you uh, need uh, either heat or, or power. And if you can store the surplus energy uh, and, and the storage becomes economical, it, it, it opens up the new world of energy. But okay, thank you very much for, for that, Tiago. And I, I'm going to take the last question now, uh, and that is from um, Michelle Riverola. Michelle is a regular on our, um, our, our webinars, and I know he asked a question, and maybe it's worth posing again, Michelle, and that, and that is, 
you know, we really got to move away from gas because, uh, you know, the, 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 the fugitive, fugitive emissions of gas are such that, in fact, a gas is no better than coal when it comes to carbon emissions, according to Michelle, and in, according to the research that he has done. Uh, so, Michelle, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but fire away with your question or questions. Okay, just one <coughs> comment for Rosalind. Um, there were there was a time when there were uh, medium temperature eutectic substances that were used quite extensively in the air conditioning industry. They went out of favor. Uh, they're now coming back. So you don't actually only have to store uh, energy in ice. You can still use temperature, um, store chill water at about six or seven degrees by using eutectic substances and make use of um the 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 properties of phase change energy okay so they probably need to to refine the substances because they degraded quite quickly over time but uh, they will be there I, I just have a comment on the um gas gas master plan now what is the wisdom in investing on a long term basis taxpayers money in conveying a fuel that you know over probably less than 25 years, you're not going to be able to use. It's the same as saying, well, let's invest money in, a, in an asbestos mine. <laughs> you're basically sinking good money after bad. You know, a, gas, a gas master plan should provide for the conveyance of a fuel that can be used. Because whether you like it or not, as of the end of this year, they're going to be border carbon adjustment taxation with the US, with the EU, with Japan, and you take like 60, 70% of our exports and you're going to wipe them off because we will be not competitive. And whether you like it or not, that is the fact. And as I mentioned, what Jack Welch said very wisely many years ago, if the rate of change outside your organization exceeds the rate of change inside your organization, and that applies to a country, you are going to go out of business. And there is no question about it. So I just see so much effort being put in. How do we cope with this? How do we cope with that? It's rather than saying, how do we engineer these problems out? Let's just say, you know, we've got a gas problem. Let's engineer gas out if that's a problem. What can we do as an alternative? And there are alternatives. I mean, there are plenty okay. of, of organizations overseas that provide information free of charge, RMI, IREC, and so on and so forth. Yeah, okay. Michelle, thanks for that. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of what you've said uh, you know, is, is comment, uh, which is highly valued as well. But uh, just to go to Roz, uh, is there anything you'd like to respond to, Roz, in that particular question that he also mentioned to you or directed to you? Can you switch on your mic, Roz? Uh, from from my side, um, yes, absolutely, wide range of substances and, and energy carriers that we should be looking at, wide wide range of ways that we, we can be storing energy. Um, it's just finding that that correct business case and that, that correct application, the correct structure to be able to take a project through for for approvals and funding and then taking it into to implementation. Um, and often we just work with what the popular technologies are at the moment, because there we've got less risk of being stopped due to technology uncertainty and and other sorts of of barriers. Um, but yeah, there's there's some some great opportunities um, out there. There's, there's some great sort of energy sources. Yes, where we can uh, look at phase change. Uh, this is a bit of a process engineer thing, but water, oh, water is amazing. The phase change energy, the like. <laughs> The maximum density at four degrees allowing ice to float like it there's there's amazing things and there's these properties with all of the substances so finding them in in an abundant format and uh, one that actually allows you to to use it without longer term life cycle damage um if we're doing a full lca um yeah ab absolutely uh Love these new things. Would love to to implement, but we focus a lot on what is being implemented at the moment because it's available, it's procurable in South Africa, which is also quite a big barrier. Often we have like huge issues with um, sort of double commissions on 
things coming into the country because you're you're paying both a local commission and an international commission. Never never mind the shipping to to take it to to get there. But I'm going I'm going broader than just the question. Um, but yes, thanks. <laughs> we will continue to to watch and if there's there's ideas that we should be considering, just uh, give us a shout because we we do like uh, we do like to see uh, what the future could be and try and structure ourselves to be ready for it. Thank you, Roz. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that really brings us to the end of the Q&A session. And it's really just left to me to say a few words uh, in wrap-up. I, I, I want to just thank our, our four presenters, Yako, Maria, Tiago, and Roz, uh, you know, for the work they've put in uh, uh, you know, to this presentation. But not only that, for the work they do in the industry, uh, for the country and, and, and for the globe. Uh, we are facing, uh, you know, major existential issues. And uh, one of them is uh, the need for decarbonization, and there are others. Uh, and it's really uh, uh, you know, a privilege to be able to interact with people from around the world, uh, locally and internationally, who can bring uh, their know knowledge and experience to our audience. Uh, it's really a privilege to have you here today. Thank you, uh, our presenters. I, I wanted to also mention you know, uh, quite a bit, not a fair bit, has been talked about terms of the carbon tax and, uh, and and the carbon border adjustment mechanisms uh, that are facing South Africa and are going to increase the pressure. One way or another, the pressure in the pressure cooker is building. Uh, and uh, companies and countries has, they need to take this seriously. Whether we believe it's fair or not is another question. But the reality is there is a carrot and there's a stick. <laughs> and and the carrots are various incentives and the sticks are the carbon tax and the cross-border adjustment mechanism, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. And in looking at these sticks, uh, there's the internal stick that is internal to South Africa, which is the carbon tax, which we know, uh, you know is going to increase and increase progressively over the years. And we are sitting at levels much lower than many parts of the world. Uh, and we're going to have to catch up. That is this. That is one of the sticks that's within South Africa's control. But the other stick is completely outside of our control, and that is the carbon border adjustment mechanism. And the, this is what is going to be imposed on us as a penalty if we don't play the game the way the world wants us to play the game, uh, whether it's fair or not is another matter. Uh, but so I want to just alert you to the fact that it's very relevant uh, to the, in today's presentation. But it's going to be particularly relevant in our next webinar on the 6th of June, which is all about uh, the carbon uh, border adjustment mechanism and the, uh, 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 you know, and the carbon taxes uh, and its impact uh, and implications on South African industry. It's my view that despite companies like uh, Impact and Rose's company who, who know these things well and take it seriously and are very proactive, I think many companies are not like that at all. And many of them wake up when it's too late. Uh, and, and you heard what Tiago said. He said the time to act is now uh, to deal with these issues that we're going to face. And I think there has been, as Yako has pointed out, uh, uh, you, you know, the, 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 the industrial gas users, perhaps, I don't want to be too harsh on them, but uh, perhaps, uh, you know, they didn't act now five years ago. Uh, and, 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 uh, and now, of course, it's become, you know, a crisis. So, uh, there is a need to to act quickly and uh, respond, uh, and, and so we're going to talk about this in our next webinar. And I hope you'll all be there. It's going to be really interesting. We've got top speakers from uh, from the European Union, who are one of the drivers behind uh, the, the CBAM, uh, you know, taxes. You can call them a tax in a way. Um, and and we've got speakers, uh, you know, from from uh, the Presidential Climate Commission. Uh, from um, the energy intensive user group in the form of uh, Huleman, uh, in, in the form of the, uh, the Minister of Trade and Industries, um, special advisor, uh, you know, from the DTIC uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, and others. Um, so it's going to be a really interesting talk. Uh, uh, and, and, and I hope that you're going to be there because it impacts South Africa very, very significantly in terms of our exports, many of our exports, aluminium, um, coal, uh, steel, iron and steel, 
chemicals, fertilizer, and, and, and other things. So uh, the, these are very important topics facing South Africa's economy and our industry, especially in the energy sector. So I look forward to seeing you there. But yeah, thanks, of course, to uh, the companies that have given us such great support in this um, particular webinar and in particular to Lumenian, uh, to Siemens Energy, uh, to the Industrial Gas Users Association, uh, to the uh, PAMSA, the, 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 uh, the Paper Manufacturers Association of South Africa, and to Impact uh, as a company uh, for, for their support. Uh, without your support, these things can't happen. And uh, I believe these organizations are far-sighted organizations that really are deeply embedded in our industry and our country and the solutions. So thank you uh, to our supporters who have supported this webinar. Thank you to our presenters. And most important, thank you to you, the audience, for your attendance and participation. And we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.